Good afternoon. Ooh, okay. I'll have to adjust, modulate. Is that okay, Angie? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill Lacey, director of the Dole Institute. I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, hopefully, our parking lot was not too difficult to negotiate this afternoon. Uh, I think the ice is melting a little bit. I can tell you this morning was very, very iffy. When I stepped onto the ice, I thought I was ready for an ice hockey match. So, uh, But I want to thank you for coming. I always introduce our fellow for the first session of our discussion groups. We're particularly proud uh, this year of this discussion group because I think it's on a topic, uh, and Jim will talk about that in a second, but it's on a topic that really does need to be discussed and needs to be thoroughly reviewed uh, by us. And I think that what I wanted to tell you is I just wanted to very briefly introduce Jim. You can find out more about him on our website or if we had a bio with the discussion group today, I'm not sure. but. Jim Jonas and I go back a little bit longer than either of us would probably care to admit, but uh, we worked together on President Bush 41's re-election campaign in 1992 and got to know each other pretty well. And then we're pretty much out of touch, <coughs> excuse me, pretty much out of touch until we invited him to come as representative of uh, Mr. Greg Orman's U.S. Senate race in 2014, and he came he said, you know, I, don't we know each other from the past? And, and neither of us, I guess, had really focused on that. You may have. But I said, yeah, and he told me what he was doing with independent political candidates and independent politics. And I said, I immediately said to him, you know, you really ought to look at our fellowship program because this would be a great topic to have. And so we're very glad that he submitted a proposal right away. And as happens a lot of times with our fellows' proposals, it gets put in a file, and I wait for a really good time to pull it out. And I thought this would be a really good time. So we're delighted to have him with you. He is going with us. He is going to have a great lineup of guests. He has a wonderful guest today that we're welcoming back to the Dole Institute for the second time, I think. Hope to have him back a third and a fourth. But please welcome our spring fellow, Jim Jonas. Jim? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. It, it's a thrill to be back here. I, I'm a huge admirer of the work that uh, the Institute is doing, and, and I was a supporter. I, I, was, I was actually a, uh, a delegate, a Dole delegate, in 1988 uh, at the state convention in North Carolina. So I was, it's always a, always a thrill to be back here. Uh, it, to introduce the, the topic and, and the discussion group uh, that I'll be uh, leading this spring, uh, it's no secret that, that the politics in Washington are broken. That, that hyperpartisanship has gone off the rails and made it nearly impossible for our leaders to, to worry about trying to fix the, the people's problems. Instead, the parties seem more, uh, uh, more attuned to trying to stay in power for themselves and, and trying to find partisan advantage instead of uh, finding the common good. And in response to this, partially, we've seen this explosion of, of people leaving the political parties and becoming independents, or at least identifying as independents. Uh, and what I want to uh, focus uh, this discussion group on is, what impact is that going to have on our politics with this explosive growth of independents uh, coming into politics and with these uh, uh, amazing uh, nonpartisan election reforms that are happening around the country in response to uh, uh, both political parties not listening to people any longer. What, what impact is that going to have on our politics, this cycle and in many cycles to come? So uh, I'm thrilled to be here uh, uh, with all of you. I appreciate you coming out today. And I'm, uh, I can't be more excited to introduce my friend Matthew Dowd because I can't think of anybody who uh, is more attuned to what's going on uh, politically in this space. Uh, if I could, just I'll read his bio so you've got a good background if you don't already know Matthew. You can edit, you can edit it. You can I, <laughs> Matthew Dowd is a best-selling author, cultural commentator, and chief political analyst for ABC News. He's worked on both sides of the aisle over the last 40 years, but now considers himself a diehard independent and started a movement pushing our leaders to put country over party. I, I own the T-shirt. Great. Every, everybody can buy a T-shirt. Uh, Dowd served as chief strategist to President George W. Bush and numerous governors and senators across the country. His latest book, A New Way, Embracing the Paradox as We Lead and Serve, details the values we need as this disruptive time 
at, at this disruptive time and how we might get back to achieving the common good. Now that's the official bio, but let me just, if I could just add a couple of points. Matthew to me is a voice of sanity, of reason and, and rational thought in a, in a dark time in our politics. And I really admire what you do and I appreciate what you do and I, and I thank you for being here with me. Uh, so we've talked about this. It's a, it, it is an incredibly uh, disruptive time uh, in our country's history. How, dis how disruptive is it? Um, well, first, great to be with you, with you uh, Jim. We, we've got to know each other in the course of, we didn't know each other in Republican politics, because I think when he was in Republican politics, I was in Democratic politics. <laughs> and then when I got in Republican politics, you were, mer you were leaving Republican politics, and then I've left Republican politics. So now we both ended up independents right. here, in, here, here in Lawrence, Kansas. <laughs> Um, it's great to be back here. I, I can't remember. I think it's been 10 years, Bill. I think it's been 10 years or so since I was here. I love, I love this place. Uh, it's such an important part. I was talking to Bill and Jim earlier how the, this, the, the, the ability to convene at this time in these places around the country is so needed. So it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming here. I, a couple of things to start that I would say is, is there's a great uh, there's a great writer who's written on history. His name is Francis Fukuyama. If you ever read any of his writings, um, it's a fabulous discussion of civilization. And in one of his books, he, he wasn't writing now. I think this is a book from seven, eight years ago, so it's long before there are current political events. Um, he talks about why do some nations have democracies and why do they succeed and other nations that don't. And he was examining the history of why in certain places of the world democracies succeed or why they some start and then fail. And he basically analyzed that. And he said the number one reason that a democracy fails or is not able to grow is because people are unwilling to come out of their tribe. And democracies only succeed when people, we're all tribal, we all have families, we all have communities, we all have allegiances, we all have prejudices, we all have biases. But democracies are dependent upon the ability to leave that tribe and do what's in the common good. And w democracies can't succeed if they don't do, if you're not able to do that. My concern today is that we are becoming increasingly tribalized and increasingly have an inability to come out of our tribe to do what's in the common good. And when you can't do that, you've be begun to damage the health of the democracy. And I think we're in a moment like that. And so to speak to where we are today is most people focus on, on earthquakes and, and um, uh, volcanoes. So an earthquake happens and they say, oh my gosh, what's going on? Or a volcano disrupts and they say, oh, look, let's focus on the volcano. Donald Trump's elected or Bernie Sanders is almost nominated or whatever it has. And people go, oh my gosh, this is a moment. Well, what people ignore is the shifting of the tectonic plates. And our, the tectonic plates of our country have been shifting politically, culturally, and economically for 25 years. And it's only now that we're seeing the eruptions of those shifting of those tectonic plates and the earthquakes happen and more are coming this is not the end of it this is the beginning of it this is we'll see aftershocks we'll see many different things this has happened before in our history um, every I'm a big fa I'm a big fan of the cycles of history every 75 years or so there's a turning in my view a turning of there's four generations and there's a turn and it usually happens in the midst of some crisis and if you think about where we were where we were 75 or 80 years ago before now, we were in the midst of the Great Depression and the advent of World War II. Changing media environment. Fundamentally changing radio had come on the scene and television was about to happen. You think about where we were 75 or 80 years ago before that, we were in the midst of the Civil War and the changing from an agrarian-based economy to an industrial-based economy. And if you think about where we were 75 or 80 years ago before that, we were in the midst of the American Revolution and the first establishment of the first modern democracy in the world. And so I think we are in that same moment. We are in that same moment of disruption at so many different levels. Our communications have been disrupted. Our politics have been disrupted. The economy has disrupted. We're basically going through our third industrial revolution, the first one being in the 1860s and then in the 1920s, 1930s with mass production, and now an industrial revolution being driven by technology. 
same level of disruption in people's lives that's causing people to say, I don't know what kind of job I'm going to have, what kind of education I need, where I'm going to be. I, liked, I, I wish I had a job like my father or my grandfather. All of those same things that have fueled angst, anxiety, frustration, anger, all of those things are emerging. And there's been cultural disruption. We've redefined marriage. Regardless of how you fall on this, we've redefined marriage, which was an institution that people thought they counted on for two, three, four, five thousand years. We've redefined marriage in the last five or six years in our country. So we're in this transformative change that's happening at all levels, and everybody's trying to figure out how to grasp with it. And part of the difficulty we have is that we have two dinosaur, I, I call dinosaur parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, that either they have to adapt to the, fundamentally adapt to that changing environment or they're going to die like the dinosaurs die because the meteors already hit the planet and just sitting in the field munching on grass like the dinosaurs did thousands of years ago, you're going to go extinct unless you evolve and adapt. And I think that's where we fundamentally are. And I, you think about every single part of our world has changed, has adapted, right? You walk, you, you can order any, you can hold, any, what you hold in your hand on your, on your phone or your device, you have more access to information than, than this, this, whole, this whole institute filled with computers 15 years ago, running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you have more access to information in your hand today than, than would have filled this, than you would have had filled this room 15 years ago. And so all of that, you walk down, I tell people, it's one of the things they think, you can order anything online, do anything online, design your own shoes and all that. You walk down the walk down the aisle in the grocery store, you have 86 varieties of toothpaste to pick from, mm -hmm. 200 and something varieties of bread to choose from. And we still have two parties that are basically fundamentally um, haven't fully adapted. Can they? Yes. And we'll have a long conversation. We're going to have a conversation about this. But that's where we are. And there's the increased frustration, which is why we keep going in these elections every cycle where we seem to switch back and forth. Well, elections, Barack Obama's elected, and the next election, the, Democrat, the Republicans take over Congress, and then Barack Obama's reelected, and then the Republicans expand their seat, and then two nominees of the two major parties are disliked and distrusted by a majority of the country. First time in our history, both major parties and both major candidates are disliked and distrusted by a majority of the country, and the country's told to choose between the two of them and you understand why there's frustration in all of that. We have a president in the current circumstances that we're in, president who started with the lowest job approval rating of any president to begin his presidency. He ended the first year in the lowest job approval rating of any president to end their first year in his presidency. Very tribalized, very polarized, very divided in how the country sees that. And I think it's an incredible opportunity. Our government needs to um, be reinvigorated and be uh, uh, changed, but it can't change until our politics fundamentally change. Government comes in the change in the government comes in the aftermath of change in our politics. And keep in mind, we've had a history. People always think, oh, we've always had the Democrats, always had the Republicans. That's the way it's always going to be. Our parties have changed. The, what the Democratic Party was 50, 60, 70 years ago is very different than what the Democratic Party is today. And the Republican Party is very different than what the Republican Party was 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. I mean, the Whigs were a dominant party in our country in, the, in this, as I said, in these, one of these crisis points, they disappeared. The Republican Party was brought up anew and reinstituted it and instituted itself. So I think we're in that level of disruption, Jim. And I think it's a huge opportunity for, for people to enact change, uh, but it's gonna take people saying, I'm just not gonna do it the old way. I saw you quoted recently as saying that uh, Trump is a great accelerator of change. What, 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 what de defines that? Uh, did you mean that a positive way? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's, uh, I'll tell you a funny story about Trump. I'll tell you a funny story. Because uh, anybody that's watched me is, um, I, I'm willing to give everybody a, a fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth chance. I believe in the process of redemption in life, and it's always giving another chance. But I've been very critical of the president. Um, critical from a sense of, I, I believe that he, he, he and President Obama did, and President Bush did, <clears throat> had unique opportunities to bring fundamental change to our country in a way to bring us together. And I don't think that's happened. Um, we're more polarized today than when Donald Trump was first elected, which is hard to believe. So I've been very critical of Donald Trump. 
very critical on a lot of things on, on whether or not he's in, in line with con the values of our Constitution, American values, all of the how we respect each other, how we appeal to each other. So this funny thing happened. It's so, so on the day of the State of the Union address, Hope Hicks, who you've probably seen, heard of, she's his communications director who's been in the news for other reasons, um, called me up on the day of the State of the Union and asked if I could go meet at the White House. This was the day of the State of the Union. So I say, I think so, I don't know, maybe, okay, yeah, I think, maybe this afternoon. And she emailed me, emails me and says, how about three o'clock? So I go to the White House, meet with her at the White House, and I think I'm meeting with her, but I think something was going on, I think. So in the middle of the meeting, she sticks her head out and says, tell me when the Vice President leaves the Oval Office. Somebody comes in five minutes later and says, the Vice President left, she goes, okay, we're gonna go, you're gonna go meet with the President. So I said, okay, I meet with the president, go in the Oval Office, just he and I, Hope's in the corner of the room, um, and, and, and much of the conversation, I agreed on his side, <coughs> would be kept confidential. Uh, but one of the, th well, the first thing, it's, it's, it's very funny, he, he, the and I've been, just keep this in mind, I've been, I've been really critical of him. And the White House has complained to ABC about my criticisms of him. It's like, I, I, I say I'm not being fair and all that. Uh, folks have called. The first thing he says is, I'm a huge fan of yours. I have so much respect for you. Um, I was like, okay, thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate that. And then he sits down and he says, isn't everything great? Isn't everything going great? And the only thing I was looked at him was like, I, you, I, I really, and I said, no, not really. <laughs> um, and then he didn't know what to say, and we went started talking about the his. Um, his the State of the Union address, which he was going to give in a few hours. Keep in mind, this is the day of the State of the Union address, so he's going to give in a few hours. And he says, well, I'm going to speak on unified, this long answer to your question, Jim, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to speak on uniting the country and healing the divide and bipartisanship. This is what I'm going to do. And I listened to him. I said, like, okay, okay. I said, but you can't just give a speech on it, right? And he said, what? I said, well, you can't just stand up in Congress and give a speech and then that's it. You have to actually show what you're doing and practice what you're doing and then give another speech on it and 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 do the things in order to heal the country. Um, uh, fast forward, that didn't happen, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> As we've seen over the last eight or nine days, or all the things that we, I mean, people, we've already forgotten the State of the Union address and it was only two weeks ago or whatever it was. I do think Donald Trump, is I will give this. I will, Donald Trump is, is, I, is, I said, a great accelerator of disruption. I think what Donald Trump is going to do is going to force people to actually come to terms with what, one, that the government's not working, that our politics is broken, and that we have to figure out a different m models and different way to do this. But also is, is I'm heartened by the fact that it's actually going to cause all of us out in the country that aren't necessarily in Washington, D. I live in Texas, um, that aren't in Washington, D.C., that basically say, who are we? And it's, I think it's an always, it's an important exercise for every country and every one to go through is, who am I, what values do I really count on, and what do I share with my fellow Americans or fellow Kansans or fellow people in my community? What do I share? And I think that's what he's gonna help, I think, accelerate in that. I think he's obviously taken advantage of a lot of the change in the communications. He's done very well at those, those changes. But I think what he's showing is both the, institution, the institutions that we have today in our politics aren't, uh, aren't, do not appeal to most of the country anymore and need to be fundamentally changed. And I'm not necessarily advocating, okay, we need to uh, you know, get rid of both major parties and that's it and all that. I'm, I'm very open to the idea that the parties can fundamentally change and adapt and do the things necessarily they do. I'm very open to that. Do I, what do I think the likelihood of that is? I think it's, usual, it's small and usually change only comes when forced, look at any industry. Industries don't fundamentally change. They don't sit around in a meeting and say, let's change today. Um, they basically are forced to change. Most, in most, most every institution is forced to change because of a changing environment and they worry, they're worried about losing market share or they're worried about losing their jobs. And I think he's helping to accelerate that. Yeah, part of the, the reason that the parties don't adapt more quickly, however, is that they, they institute and create and construct these barriers to entry. So it, it's as if Yellow Cab and Checker Cab uh, put up a law and said there cannot be an Uber. And so how do we 
How do we get to that place where there can be an Uber of politics that can break through and start bringing some of that competition back to the marketplace of politics? So it's a great question, and I, every 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 part of the market always does this. Everybody that's an incumbent in the marketplace always figures out, tries to figure out a way to game the system in such a way to keep themselves in power. It whatever doesn't matter who is. I'll give you a story from my state, Texas. Southwest Airlines was this upstart airline that happened. 35, 40 years ago. Braniff, if you remember Braniff, it's gone now, but Braniff and American Airlines were the dominant dinosaurs, and they were going to stop out, stamp out this little upstart, right? They were just going to, and, and they passed all kinds of regulations to try to keep them. They had passed this right amendment deal. They couldn't fly from Dallas. They had to stop at one place. All of these things they tried to do in that place. What basically Southwest Airlines figured out was is if we provide good service at a good cost over time, we're going to beat them, right? If we provide good service at a good cost and we're responsive to the customers, very responsive to the customers. And so even though they were up against these hurdles, as often is, they stayed to it, stays to it. Now one of those airlines is out of business. The other airline does basically doesn't even fly in these short routes much anymore. American doesn't fund hasn't I don't know the last time American, maybe they've made a profit recently. Southwest Airlines, I think, has made a profit every year for the last 20 years. American, I don't know if they've made a profit in the last 20 years. American Airlines has um, in this. And so, one, I think it's going to be who is most customer-centric? Who, who is going to be most fundamentally customer-centric and willing to stay in this game for more than one election cycle? I think part of the problem with all of us is our attention spans and our dedication is too short, is that we think, okay, if we didn't do this, if Mike Bloomberg didn't run as an independent, then we're not going to be able to do it, or whatever else the thing that we pull, the pie in the sky thing that we pull out thinks needs to happen. In order for the change to happen, as you look at our history, it is a series of things happen over the long haul, over the long haul. And I, it, this is also akin to the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement didn't just happen. The Civil Rights Movement fun, really, I mean, you could look at various stopping points around the Civil Rights Movement, but it really began when African-American soldiers came home from World War II and basically said, this doesn't work, right? I was treated very differently, and they started the process. And that process of civil rights, of passing legislation, and doing all that tech, then took basically 30 years, right? Our politics, I think, is fun. Not, not to say that this only needs to take 30 years and there we could see things happen quickly. I think that's, that's definitely an option. But I think it's more than one election cycle. It's more than just, okay, we're going to try to do this in 2018 and 2020, and, and those barriers. And what you'll, fund, what you'll find out is, is, are the, is the GOP and is the Democratic Party willing to adapt to the fundamentally change? Because they, won't be, they will not adapt. I guarantee this. They will not adapt until they feel like their jobs are in jeopardy. It's the only time they're in jeopardy because it happens almost in every single industry. They're a duopoly. And, and the, the, the things that duopolies, the, uh, little that do they agree on, except that they don't like competition. So uh, when we talk about the, the, the spe specifics, the mechanics of, of competition, what does country over party look like? And so, so what, uh, what are the things that, that independents can do or people who are fed up with, with the hyperpartisanship? What does that mean at the state level, uh, uh, running people for office? bringing more people into the system, maximizing the number of people who are actually turning out? So my, my, I started this country over party thing where I put a great little logo because I was like, I'm just tired of complaining about this. I got to do something. And so it, you know, some, we're on an airplane or something. I came up with the idea and so then printed stickers and put, put them out. And I was like, I got to do something. And I did it on my own, put money, put, paid for it and all of that. And my whole idea is I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican or independent. I don't care doesn't matter to me, right? But I want you to put country over party, right? I, and, and I think most of America wants that. Most of America wants our leaders to quit putting party first and country second. Or, or and, and you can use that as a euphemism for many different things. It can be, you know, community, party over communi community over party, or, or profit over, over, over the community, or whatever the thing happens to be. It's, it's, a, it's putting the whole in the head of the part. That's really what it's about. How do you put the whole ahead of the part? And my whole idea about this was to try to get people to start begin talking about it, to get moving on it, and, and act, act in their own manner. I'm fully, I would be fully cheer on somebody that works in the Democratic Party that's frustrated by the system, decides to run for office as a Democrat because they think that the, their party system isn't working. 
Because you can put country over party as a Democrat, you can put country over party as a Republican, and you can put country over party as an independent. I think it's very hard to do in the, being an incumbent party because of all the things you're basically forced to do. Um, I, I think of the two incumbent parties, and I, I, could, I worked on both. I worked for Democratic candidates and worked for George W. Bush and Arnold Schwarzenegger, so I've worked on the Republican and Democratic side. But to me, the two incumbent parties are like a sick building, right? And it's got mold and it's got lead pipes in the building. And you can be as healthy as can be and say, I'm going to go in this building and I'm healthy as can be, and then if you spend too much time in the building, you get sick, right? Or you leave. You're like, I'm not going to stay in that building. I'm getting out of here, which is a lot of people. A lot of the people, younger people are like, these buildings, these buildings make me sick. I'm not going to be any part of this deal. And, and I think that's part of the difficulty of fundamentally changing the two incumbent parties. It's very possible. And so country over party is just a broad way. I, I, I believe, this is my opinion, I think that the rise of independence not necessarily a party per se, because that always comes in the aftermath. You don't start a party, you know, it, you, don't, you didn't start ride share association and then go, go find an Uber. You started Ubers and Lyfts and then a ride share association formed in the aftermath. And so people are going to just stand up and say, I'm either going to run as a Democrat or run as a Republican. But I think it would be really helpful to our society because primaries now, primaries right now, the elections are held before November decide 85% of the offices held in our country. 85% of the offices held in our country are decided before you ever get to the November general election. 85%. And the only way that's going to change is if the red areas and the blue areas feel like they have to compete again in a general election. And so that's why I'm a big fan of the idea of independents forcing this and forcing response from the Democrats and forcing response from the GOP. A country over party is really for anybody that has any flag to try to put country ahead of party. We were talking a little before uh, we, we came out uh, here, and uh, this horrible tragedy that happened in Florida uh, this week. Uh, but the response from these young people has been really remarkable. And I've, I've heard you say this before, don't wait to lead. Uh, it, it, and it was really striking to me of seeing these, these kids who, who are – of an incredibly, <laughs> they seem so young to me, uh, but so mature in their own way of their response. And it strikes me that that's where this change is going to happen because these kids didn't grow up in the age of uh, this false choice of red versus blue. Uh, th th they're they're going to demand something better, right? You, the, the, the interesting thing about this generation of folks, this generation of folks solves problems on their own quickly. And we saw this after Katrina. This is an interesting thing. They didn't wait on like the government to think. People started getting online and saying, I know somebody has a generator, a generator on eBay, and I'm going to get it shipped over to uh, New Orleans. And there's a generation of folks that solves their own problems, that does their own thing, that hurry up and says, I've got to find this. I'm not going to wait on this. I'm going to go solve this problem. And so I think leaders, by and large, especially in Washington, never lead. They never lead. They follow. And the best of the leaders figure out where the country needs to go, and they get one half step in front of where the country already is going. Those are the best of leaders. They get one half step, and then they figure out a way to ride that river that, that's already moving in that direction. I think this debate that's now, it's now been engaged on guns in America. I live in Texas. I live in a small town in Texas. I live in a precinct that voted by 20 points for Donald Trump. I own five rifles. But it's ludicrous that we can't have a conversation about something, some common sense things that can be done that constantly get stopped. If you look at the polls on this, this is why how, how, it's just evidence of an unhealthy system. You look at on polls on various things, on background checks, on access to certain weapons, on integrated databases, on many different things, on age limits, all those things. It's overwhelmingly supported by the country, overwhelmingly supported by the majority of the country, but it's not happening. Like many things, they're overwhelmingly. DACA is a, solving the DACA situation is another example. Overwhelmingly supported by the country, it's not happening. It's not happening because of the system that we're in. These 15 and 16 year olds are no longer going to wait on the system. They're not going to be, well, we have to have a subcommittee meeting and we're going to do this and then six months from now we'll get back to you on this. And their basically message is we've had enough of do nothing 
it's time to do something. Just do something. Just do something. And it's, it, I'm very proud of this generation of folks that's coming. That's, there, there's a generation before this. My oldest son, out of the blue, while I was in the midst of the Bush reelect, decided to enlist in the Army on his own. He was in college. He enlisted in the Army. He got sent on two tours of duty in Iraq. And now he's working for a venture capital thing on disruptive change and various things in New York. This is a series of generation of folks that is going to lead us. I think we, all everybody in this room, it's always important to be, um, I think, a great deal of mentoring. I think that part of, I think, what we all should see our job is, in my view, is how do we mentor the, of, of people that are actually this rising group of change that's coming, but they're not going to wait. They're not going to, they're going to have this, if they, if, if the White House thinks they can hold this listening session and then go about their business as usual, they're fooling themselves. Um, by holding this listening session, I don't think they realize fundamentally what they just did. They're letting the cat out of the bag. And uh, it's going to just keep moving. This is a fire that's, that's been begun, and they're just put, they helped put gasoline on it. But I think somebody over there said, oh, we'll just do this, and then we'll go walk out, and then we'll just go back. It'll be all fine. It's not going to be fine. This generation is not going to stop. Uh, the, the Russian meddling uh, it, it, that's been in the news lately, uh, everyone is focused on that the Russians were, were their intent was to sow chaos. Uh, and it, it, maybe they did, maybe they were successful, but I would argue that, that it wasn't so much that they created it, but they tapped into something that was already there. Uh, and it, it used to be that we could have political disagreements and political arguments, but we could still keep uh, the ability to come together and solve big problems. And I was struck by this quote that, that I, I really loved. It was, in a, it was a political scientist asked about this problem who said, uh, compromise is the core of democracy. It's the only way we can govern. But when you make people feel threatened, nobody compromises with evil. H how, do we, how do we break that? So, so here's, a, here's the, what's happened. And I think this has been one of, with every change in technology, there's good that comes and there's bad that comes. Think about every change that in, in history of technological change for all of the things, from everything from the written word. The written word was great, great advancement, but it actually changed our oral tradition and we lost something there. And so the, the, the techno technological change that has, that has divided our communication marketplace, good in many ways, but the bad thing about it is now is that everybody can now access information that confirms their own biases. Right? And so people ask, watch a cable channel because it confirms their own bias. And, and, what, and then that happens is, here's what happens. If you have an opinion and I have an opinion and you have an opinion and you have an opinion, we could sit down and have a conversation. But if you've confirmed your bias over and over and over again by act, the way you access information, whether it's on websites or radio, television, whatever it happens to be, your opinion becomes a fact. And if you have a set of facts, and I have a set of facts, and you have a set of facts, and you have a set of facts, there's no way to reach consensus. And so that's, I think, part of the problem that we're in, is there's no common set of facts. There's no common set of facts. I can have a debate with anybody, conservative, progressive, moderate, whatever, have, if we agree and stipulate to a common set of facts. But because of the way people are gathering information and how they're in, and we've tribalized not only our politics, but our communication, mm -hmm. it makes it increasingly difficult, and the only way we can do that, is we have to break out of that mold and access information that makes us uncomfortable. That we have to go to areas that we're not used to. We have to serve, we not only access information, we now live around people. 20 years ago, this is an interesting stat, think about it. 20 years ago, 75% of America was likely to live by somebody of the opposite political party. Today, 20 years later, 75% of America lives by somebody of the same political party. And so not only has our communication changed, but the way we associate has changed. And, how, and all of that feeds this problem that we're unwilling, and now we think we have facts behind us in, in all of this and how we do this, which we don't. We have opinions that have now been, we've been told that we're reassured on, or biases more likely, biases that we've been reassured on in this. And so the only way we do is we have to encourage people how to, how to move out of that, get out of that comfort zone of just accessing information. And we have to, I think, fundamentally demand our leaders that they, have, that they come to us with facts, not just, not just biases led to a certain 
party, not just biases led to a certain policy initiative. And I think a huge part of this is, is ideology, too much adherence to ideology gets in the way of governance, too much adherence to ideology. Um, you can have a set of values. People always say, well, if you don't do that, you're not going to have any values. Well, you can have a set of values. I believe in tolerance, respect, honesty, integrity. You can have a series of values, the common good, all those things. But when we lock ourselves into ideology, then we, don't, we stop listening. We stop listening, and then we have no empathy. I mean, to me, one of the biggest divides in our, company, uh, in our country is, em is an empathy divide. If you talk to Hillary Clinton voters, they have no empathy of why somebody might have voted for Donald Trump. What, 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 what was it causing them to vote for Donald Trump? What fears did they have? Anxieties did they have? What was causing them to do that? Concerns they had, all the things. And you may not agree with them, but there was many concerns of people had that have lost, lost touch with their culture, lost touch with their economy, lost touch with many different things, lost touch with what they thought America in their mind was supposed to be. And the same is true of Trump voters. Trump voters had no idea why people uh, that, under, that are critical of him might think that he, there's certain things he's done, said, or whatever, have been scary. So not only is it a, we have to jump over the factual divide problem, but we have to jump over the empathy problem. Let me ask you to put your, your uh, consulting, your political consultant hat on for a minute and talk about some of the, the challenges that, that independents and third parties have. Uh, the, there, there are these enormous uh, political industrial complexes that have been created by both of the parties, that they have their own set of consultants and they have their staff and they have their lawyers and they have their fundraisers and their data sets and all these things that are in enormous advantages for the parties and, and disadvantages for independents and, and emerging third parties. How do independents break through that? And how do they start to get to a level playing field to be able to compete with that? So the first, the biggest hurdle, I mean, as, as you know very well, Jim, there, there's many hurdles that are put in place that make it very hard for independents to run. Not only they have a series of things they have to do to get on the ballot, and all of the thing, infrastructure problems and all that, that independents have, have to struggle with against a system and that. That's all fine. You can overcome those. The biggest problem is psychological, is voter psychology. Because voters, it, they, they basically want to be able to vote for somebody they think is going to win. And so they, the voters, a broad variety of voters say, I'm going to consider an independent, but then they get down to it, it's like, well, it's they can't win, so I'm going to go vote for the Democrat, or I'm going to vote for the Republican, because that's who's going to, that's who's likely to win, or that's what I'm going to do. And that, to me, is the psychology that has to break over time, and that will be broken as soon as independents start winning. As soon as people say, "Oh, an independent can win," then the psychology breaks, and then there's a flood, because the biggest hurdle is psychology. In that, I think that independents, um, it's going to take independents being really smart about um, how they campaign and where they campaign and not getting dragged. This is the biggest problem, I think, if I were consulting any candidates. They get dragged into, into politics of the, of the status quo, right? And so they get forced to answer questions in a certain way because that's how it's always been done. Um, I mean, I, a perfect example is, is if, I were, if I were running for Congress, United States Senate, and I was an independent, and I was asked the question, who are you going to caucus with? I would say, I'm caucusing with neither party. Yep. As soon as you say, well, I'll caucus with the Democrats or I'll caucus with the Republicans, but I'm going to be an independent, you, what you've just told people are is that you're really not an independent. Yep. You're part of the system. You, you and so I would, and then people that argument it that if you go into editorial boards, because I've been on a lot of editorial boards up in, and for a lot of different candidates, and the, they'll say, well, well, then if you don't commit to caucus with a party, then you're not going to get put on the good committees. And if I were a candidate and I were a consultant or somebody to impress, I'd be like, that's great. Don't be, put me on one of your BS committees <laughs> that doesn't do any work anyway and nobody shows up to and all that. And put me, put me in a phone booth. If you, I'm not going to get in a good office, that's fine. Put me in a phone booth down Pennsylvania Avenue. I don't care because I'm going to work in the, the best interest of whomever it is, Texans, Kansas, Kansans or whatever. And so I think a huge... One psych psychological hurdle that has to be overcome, and the only way that's overcome is by winning. Um, and then once that happens, there'll be a flood. But I think the biggest thing that I think I see independents make mistakes on is getting dragged into the same conversation in the same way. And they have to figure out a way to, you know, one of the things they should is we're gonna, they should say, listen, not only do we have to change our politics, but we have to redefine how we look at our office holders. 
Just because a congressman behaved in this way and this is what they did doesn't mean it should always be they. In the 21st century, a senator or a congressman or a governor, maybe you redefine the office in a way that says that's not, that's not, they, they may think that's the way you to do it, but that's not the way we need to do it. So don't get dragged into the typical status quo thing because once you're in the weeds with the two major parties, they know the weeds yep. better than you, better than any independent does. So that's the two things. You have to break the psychological barrier and don't get dragged in the weeds. Yeah, and, and I think uh, it, it, having been through a couple of these, it, 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 it's all too easy because that's, uh, the, the parties have created this construct to make you want to make everybody feel like that's the way it's supposed to be. It's, it's, it's this or that. It's red or blue. It's conservative or liberal. There's not any other choice. And so playing outside of that is so difficult to break through. And then you have uh, each side has their own media. And how do you, uh, when did the media get to be uh, this weaponized thing where, where it, it, the, the Republicans have their media outlets, the Democrats have their media outlets? Do independents have a, a, a prayer of breaking through with that? Well, I, um, so yes, they do. And this obviously began, as you know very well, this began um, in the emergence of various cable channels. It began, then radio shows, talk radio, and all of the things that happen on talk radio. And then obviously the internet has helped that in that. One of the things that, I mean, I try and, and try to be, I try to throw flags on whoever the, players are that I think are screwing up. I happen to be throwing a lot more flags on the Republican Party these days because they hold power, and I think part of my job is to hold power accountable. But I also think they've diverged, and this is my view, my Matthew's opinion, they've diverged more than, more than any other, other, other party away from the common good. I think they've diverged from that more so in this um, time. Um, and so I think one of the things that I would say, people in this room or anybody, is I think you can demand that radio shows, um, um, forums, include somebody to speak for the independence of the country. And so don't just, it's, it, don't let them just default to that we're going to get the D, we're going to get the R, they're going to throw food at each other, and then we're going to go, okay, show's over. They just throw food at each other, and that is, is demand that an independent of some kind, and you can find him in any community, demand that an independent be placed on the, on the platform. Um, and, I, you know, CNN, I don't understand, one of the things I don't understand, CNN, I would have thought, would have captured this. If I were CNN, in the environment that we're in, because MSNBC leans, obviously, more towards the progressive side, Democratic side, Fox News leans way to the Republican side, the conservative side, I would have thought in CNN would have stood up and said, we're not going to do that, and we're not going to have that. We're going to basically be the independent channel, mm -hmm. which is about 40% of the country, fundamentally. 35 to 40% of the country really has, doesn't have strict allegiance to the two parties. But they haven't. They've gone into this same old, you watch their, plat watch their panels. Yep. It's, you know, eight people, and four of them are, four of them is four and four, and they all throw stuff at each other, and then the country goes, oh, my gosh, why am I watching this? What's, 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 is there a basketball game on? <laughs> um, the Jayhawks, I know, are doing well, um, <laughs> really well. Though you have to play the Texans again. Maybe, um, maybe we'll win that game. The Longhorns, you have to play the Longhorns again. Um, so, yeah, I think demand. I mean, think demand it. Demand it. If there's a radio show and they're talking about local politics, demand that they include an independent. Well, I'm going to do one more question, then we'll take some audience questions. But we're on the campus here of uh, at Kansas. There's some young people here who are uh, interested in politics. Uh, interested maybe in going into politics. Can you talk a little bit about your journey into po How did you get into politics and, and how did, what was your career path? So when I was, uh, when I was just a young boy, um, when I was 12, I, the Watergate hearings happened and I got fascinated by it. And I was just like, this is amazing. And I watched, I remember on, um, summer vacations, watching the hearings and everything that was going on. It was just fascinating that here's a president and the Congress and these reporters and all that. And ever since that day, I was like, this is something I want to be involved with in some way. And then what I decided to do in that, I was like, well, what can I do? So I read a lot and did all those things, but I was like, well, I can start volunteering. So I just like volunteered to do anything for, any can for a candidate. So I did that, sort of got, you know, passed out literature, did all those sorts of things. I then went to school in St. Louis, worked on 
various campaigns. My first vote I cast was for Ronald Reagan in 19, was the first vote I cast was for Ronald Reagan in 1980. And worked for Dick Gephardt, who was a congressman from in, when I was in college, to, as for free as part of a, working in college. And I just did that af one after another campaigns and worked on that, studied it, talked to people, had conversations with people. And in the great thing about politics is if you s work hard and and study and study the things and watch people and care about people and care about the, what you're doing is that, that you'll find your way in the system that people will see you. Quality stands out in politics. It always does. And it may take a few years, took a few years of me working in various politics and then, you know, I worked for candidates and then I had just happened to be in the right place at the right time with, when George W. Bush decided that he was governor and I had run the lieutenant governor of Texas's two, the, two campaigns. I met him, met Governor Bush, and it just so happened, it just worked out its way, and I got blessed or lucky in the midst of all of that. And so I would say is, um, is, is don't think you're starting too low, because in politics, quality rises very fast, really, really fast. So if you think I'm just handing out yard signs, you, people figure out pretty quickly um, you know, who's the quality? And you go pretty quick. I remember I was in one of the first campaigns and after I did a few volunteering, they thought I was smart enough so, and they didn't want to pay me, so they made me the field director, which is what they <laughs> always do. <laughs> oh, you're the field director, which meant I was in charge of the other volunteers, which was a great experience. I loved it and I wasn't in it. I've never been in. I've been blessed in my life and everything that, and all the things that I've done in that. But I've never been in it for the money. I didn't care about the money. I wasn't, it was just like, because I love the system. I love this country. I love the idea that you can uh, push for change. And the other thing I would advise students, or anybody at any stage in their life, in, in order to find your place in politics, I think you have to ask yourself, what breaks your heart? Really, what breaks your heart? As you watch the news, as you watch what goes on, as you think, what really breaks your heart in what's happening? And if you can, once you know that, then you know where you should go and what you should do in this. And, and you can watch enough of politics, there's enough areas, it's tough enough, there's enough stuff going on in whatever way, in whatever you come from, is figure out what breaks your heart and that's really where your purpose is. And whatever breaks your heart is where your purpose ought to be. Great answer, love it. So we're, we'll open it up to some questions. Uh, wait for the microphone uh, down here in front, please. Thank you very much for being here. We have in recent months been reading stories about the lack of transparency in Kansas government. When you reflect on transparency, what are the basic principles that you think are most applicable to this fourth generation turning? I think this is, this. so I'm glad you asked this, this question or touched upon this area. I, I'm amazed that there's, there is so much in this day and age of information sharing, how there's so much hide the ball that's still practiced. And if you think about so many instances of, of scandals that have happened and problems that have happened, they would most all have been solved by more transparency and openness, almost every one of them. The Flint water situation is a perfect example of people that played hide the ball because you know what they s told themselves? At every level, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, in that horrible crisis that happened in Kansas, on, in, in Kansas, in Flint, on the lead in the water, they decided that, that giving information to the people of Flint was going to upset them too much so they didn't give it to them. They would respond, they weren't going to respond in the right way and they would be over exercised and all that. And that was, if they had given the information out, demands would have been made and this would have not become, it would have, problems would have been solved along the way. And so for me, in this time where technology allows us, I don't understand, give me another example, I don't understand why they still keep holding closed door meetings in Congress. Right? They keep, uh, uh, there's more closed door meetings in Congress than open meetings in Congress, right? And they're like, well, we can't do this. It's, you know, concerns and people. They basically don't trust Americans. They basically don't trust us because they think, oh, forgive me the information. There's no telling what the hell upset they'll get or what'll happen and all that. And 
for me, it's a perfect, and, and you know what's happening, goes to your point about this fourth turning and the change in, the, in communication, is people are doing it anyway, right? You know, Edward Snowden, whatever you think of all of the things that happen and all the certain level of WikiLeaks and all the things, it's basically getting ahead of wherever the politicians are in this. And so to me, if I were, I mean, there's various things. If I had a platform of I want to do on a campaign, one, I would start with integrity, right? I would be basically say, like, listen, you may disagree with me on X, Y, and Z, but, like, this isn't a time we have people of integrity. One of the other big ones is transparency and openness of government. And demand, let people make decisions. Give people the information. Let people have the information. People aren't stupid. People can have things. And basically, start opening up the process of government. Open it up, the process of government. Open it up in a way at the every single level. And I understand the part of the problem that we have in state government, and I don't know what the situation fully here is in Kansas, but part of the problems we have in state governments all over the country is because of what's happened in the diminished, diminished sense of the press, right? We've lost many papers. We've lost investigative journalists. We've lost a lot of that. And so more more stuff's getting away with in local governments, state governments and local governments than ever before because nobody's watching them and nobody's asking the questions. And so, but that's going to get, as I say, that's again, it's a train that's coming because the access to information now and more and more of these young people are basically like, I don't understand. I'm just going to put the information out there. I'm just going to put it out there. I found it. I got it. Somebody accessed the internet, got the thing. I'm just going to shove it out there. There's no reason why I can't make, I can't get this information out there. So I think it's a huge thing that's coming, but again, our leaders are still, our leaders have a, an, an incredible capacity to be, let's just say this as diplomatically as possible, overly paternalistic <laughs> um, with the idea that we somehow can't handle the information as it exists. So I say, I, I default to more transparency. I default to transparency. You have to, it's like the question that they, that they tell you the best question to say when your kid wants to do something. Don't say no first and work yourself to yes. Say yes first and work yourself to no. <laughs> right? That's what you should, because a parent sometimes, no, 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 wait, wait, it's not gonna think, think, but you should say yes. Oh, wait, why shouldn't you do that? And I believe the same thing about transparency. We ought to say yes to it, and if there's a reason, then work yourself to no. That's what I think. Hi, my name is Mark Johnson. Um, I don't know quite where to start. There's so many things I could ask, but there's one there I've decided on one, and that is I think your statistics on independence are, are just flat wrong. People say, I think you said 40%. I think that's driven by party registration, and party registration is only required in states that have either closed or hybrid primaries. Uh, the, I live in Kansas City, Missouri. We have open primaries. We don't have to register. So Missouri has completely unreliable statistics on, on party loyalty. If there, if there were indeed 40% of the, of the electorate cons consisted of independents, what percentage of those do you think are really available to vote for one side or the other side? In other words, to vote really for the best person. My impression is that the vast majority of them will vote for, typically vote for the Democrat or the Republican, and that in fact, true independence may consist of only 10% yeah. of it, the electorate. And I'm just, I'm just, I'd just like to get your thoughts about that. Yeah, and, and uh, almost all the political scientists will agree that the, the, the pure independence versus the leaners, and pure independence is probably somewhere between 12 and 20%. Uh, then you've got this whole swath of people who are culturally, uh, historically affiliated with one side or the other. But, but w since we've never given people uh, a, an option other than red or blue, uh, they don't even know that, that brown exists. Uh, th so it, I, I believe, and, and a lot of studies will show this, that when you do introduce a competitive, a, a, a viable, independent, credible independent into the race, that you can expand that number vastly. So yes, right now, the number is much smaller than when people say it's 40% of the electorate. You know, Gallup, just last month, had it at 43% of the electorate now think of themselves, consider themselves independent. I, I, I hear what you're saying. That doesn't mean there truly are pure independents, but uh, it's moving in the right direction. 
And I mentioned to Matthew right before we started, there was a uh, survey in uh, Marquette University did and showed that uh, Republicans are, the trend line on Republicans right now is just awful for, for they're leaving in droves and they're not just going over to being independent leaners, they're going all the way over to being independents. So uh, the, the numbers are rising and I think you're gonna see even more of that with this generation and the generation behind it uh, are really gonna demand uh, more, more choice and more voice in, in our politics, and you're going to see that number vastly expand in, in pure independence. So, and I'm totally, and I totally with what Jim just said, and I actually don't dispute much of what you said. The only thing I'll say is, which goes back to the point is, is this that's the psychological problem of this situation. That's the psychological problem that we're in because people basically say, I got to put on a jersey and there's nobody really wearing the purple one, so I'll have to put a red or a blue one on, but I'd really rather wear the purple one, but I'm gonna go ahead and put the red or blue on because that's really the only ones that are gonna really be playing. That's really the fundamental problem. People are, do not like the allegiance they have. Many don't like the allegiance they have to the Democratic Party, but they think that's the only option if the only other option is Republican, and the same is true of Republicans on Democrats. Once that barrier, as I keep saying, once that barrier is broken and people finally feel like there's another option, then I think that you'll see this isolate, that it'll begin to isolate itself. But in the, in the short term, in the interim, as the, the battles are fought, that's why it's gonna take some candidates that either have money as independents or some celebrity status or some unique set of circumstances to break through that psychological thing initially until it, the playing field is more even in people's minds. I think that's the case. I was involved, I did a, we did a study, and this has been a few years that I was involved in. Let me give you sort of how the country breaks down. And so, if you look at people that are, if you sort of put them as like, you would think are staunch Democrats, and so they're for larger, let's just say these things, larger government, culturally progressive, and a more progressive tax system, right? They represent about 20, four percent of the country, that group of voters, right? And then you take culturally conservative, smaller government, which nobody seems to represent anymore, um, <laughs> fundamentally, and a tax, a low tax system. So culturally conservative, low tax, um, and sort of more prototypically r dark red. That represents about 25 percent of the country. Fifty-two percent or whatever, the 52 or 53 percent of the country, 51 percent of the country, is not that. They're either, they're either social progressives and, and fiscal conservatives or some combination of that that doesn't fit in that. And for those people, the two major political parties as they experience them today, that's the choice they feel. So they have to feel like, well, I'm closest to the one that's that but I really am not comfortable with all of this other stuff. And so I think these numbers vary in all of that, that we've never had a situation for a length of time, a period of time in our country, which we've had now, where both major political parties are overwhelmingly disliked by the majority of the country. Mm -hmm. Usually what happens is one car party rises and the other party falls. So the Republicans do badly and the Democrats are viewed well, or one other one rises. Today both are fallen and they're both at an all time low both political parties at an all-time low. And so it creates this disruptive moment, opportunity, but I agree with you. Part of the problem is, is that we've had a history of a two-choice system, red or blue, and people fundamentally don't want to throw their vote away, and until they get in the position where they no longer think it's a throw vote, their vote away, they're gonna try keep, they're gonna decide they're gonna vote for the Republican governor of Kansas or whatever, because they just don't think that the independent can win. Now you may have a unique, Kansas may have, Kansas may lead the way on this, you, you almost elected the first f true independent, um, really, and fundamentally in taking on an incumbent party a few years ago that Jim was involved in. You may have the opportunity for governor that depending on what happens in the both parties' primaries, another independent to emerge, but it's gonna take some time. More questions? I know there was one down here that I, okay. And we'll come over. 
Um, you mentioned the gun debate earlier um, in the discussion, and I'm wondering how you think the independent politics could be kind of a solution to that gun debate. I know you said the younger generation is really going to demand change, and I think that's true. And I'm also wondering kind of how independents can tiptoe into Washington without getting funding from you know, those poisonous organizations that um, fund a lot of politicians and influence how they vote, kind of like the NRA. So I think the gun debate, as I referenced, and among other debates, another one is the infrastructure. The overwhelming part of the country thinks we ought to be spending more on infrastructure in our country, and we're not doing it, right? And the overwhelming majority of the country thinks we ought to be fiscally responsible, and we're not doing it. And the overwhelming majority of the country thinks we ought to be doing something on gun reform, and we're not doing it. And there's a whole series of things that is building and building and building. The young people have now identified because of what happened in, in Florida and in the high school, tragically, that they're focused now on, like, why aren't we doing something on the guns? Why, what, like, what's, what's holding this up? So they're identifying the corruption of the system that has prevented this. And so I think it's going to be part of that because most people, I would say I could take everybody in this room and we could go in that conference room and an hour later we would have, we would have agreed upon what our gun policy ought to be. One hour. With everybody in this room, and I don't even know the background of everybody in this room, we'd go in there and some people would say, we make sure of the Second Amendment, and some people would say, and we would sit around and say, okay, what can we do? And then we'd walk out and say, okay, we have it. Done. I think that level of frustration with guns, now it's because most people have seen now it's a life or death issue, and I don't know how many times we're going to keep having these incidents where we say thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, and we don't do anything. And I think the frustration is growing and growing and growing because of that. So I think that's a big that's a big part of if I were involved in the disruptive part of this, if I were more, if I were running a candidate in the disruptive part of this, I'd, that's an issue that I'd pick up on. And you, oh, on money. The great thing about today is that money matters less than ever before. People, we constantly hear the difference is a big money, big money, big, big money matters less today than ever. It was big money mattered because you had to have enough money to put on television ads and they cost thousands and thousands and thousands of millions of dollars. Well, now people now are consuming information and accessing information in a much different way. And the commercials they see, they now discount greatly. And so your ability to enter in the system and the barrier that money used to provide and being needing to raise money from things that might taint you in this process is less and less and less and less. Money still matters. But the other thing about money is it's much easier now to raise grassroots dollars at $20, $10, $30 at a pop today without holding big events, which cost, which in years past cost thousands and thousands of dollars to hold an event. And who's got the list? You can now start raising money quickly as all these systems that raise money for all crowdsourced. You basically have, can have crowdsourced campaigns today that you never could before. And so I think it's getting much easier for these people to sneak in, as you say, into Washington, D.C. Um, without having the baggage of the bags of money that they've had to do than ever before. Money matters less today than ever before. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, we observe or we hear things every day from, from uh, politicians and that we wonder how in the world that person got elected. And uh, all politics is local is the saying. Do you think that term limits would help independents uh, compete in the long term, short and long term? I'm, I'm, so I've, I'm just gonna just be transparent about my, um, <laughs> about my, uh, how my journey on this, on the journey on term limits. And because I love politics and I love the system and all of that, I was always sort of, no, we have a thing called term limits and it's the election, it's the ballot box, and we don't need term limits, and we ought to, and that was always my sort of path, like, well, no, people, if people just vote, they can exercise their term limits, and that's, that's how it is, and no, 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 don't impose something outside on it. I've now gone to, we need term limits. And that's where I've arrived, because maybe at some point we don't need them, and we can, we can say, okay, we got a system now that's working, and it's people have a challenge, or able to challenge people in general elections, but the way the system, and Jim and I may, he, I don't know what Jim's, we haven't ever had this conversation, but the way the system is done today, I actually believe that an external th thing forcing people not to run, I mean, it's ludicrous to me 
that we have these decades after decades of decades and you can't ever, and there's generations of folks have now never been given the opportunity to serve because of people holding these offices for low, so long because they know the players in their party primary and because that's where the elections have been fundamentally decided up until now or through now that they have an ability to sort of do that system and stay in place and just be there for year after year after year after year. And so I'm become, uh, I become much more of a believer in the idea of term limits to be able to get us to a place where we can finally get enough of these people out that we can have a system now in place that be, we, be, we again have competitive elections. Term limits on its own is not going to work. But term limits combined with a series of other changes, including the rise of independence, I think could fundamentally change our our political world. And I don't know yeah, where I, I, I'm. Uh, I, I'm pretty close to that. I I, I tend to uh, agree with you that where I was 20 years ago would be that every election is an opportunity for a term limit. So I I didn't get to that place. I, I'm more focused on uh, changing the way we elect people in the first place. So I uh, I'm a big proponent of ranked choice voting. Uh, top four, perhaps, or nonpartisan primary or nonpartisan uh, general elections. Anything that we can do to to make it so that it's more competitive uh, in these districts, because a lot of these folks are because of gerrymandering more than anything else, they're going to keep getting elected no matter what they do. I mean, I've, there's I, I don't I won't pick on any individual folks. We all know some of these people who should have retired a long time ago and never should be there, but they just keep getting elected and they just keep showing up and not achieving anything and they keep getting elected. But I think if you change the, the way that we put people in office in the first place, where they have to talk to more than just their base voters, uh, it'll, it'll eliminate the need for, for uh, term limits because we're gonna get a lot of turnover uh, from people who aren't listening to their constituents. Okay, what, I'm getting one more question, thank you. Uh, yes, um, in the current Senate and in, in Congress, who are those individuals who you think are acting more independent or more moderate and give us some hope? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start with the second one. I have a, I have, I am, I'm like a optimistic, romantic in so many different ways. I've been married twice, so I'm ultimately, I'm an optimist. Um, so I'm very optimistic because I think we needed to go through a moment like this. I think our country, when these moments, and, and, the, and I know they feel very anxiety-ridden, as I say, and lots of frustration and anger, but I think there's many scabs of America that had to be ripped off, cleaned, and so we can move on and heal. And I think we're in that moment. I think that we're going to get to where we need to go. But as somebody said, and one friend of ours said, democracy is a gift. It's not a given. And we're going to have to fight for it. Right? It, every one of these moments, if you look at all of these moments that I mentioned to you in our history, there was no guarantee we were going to get through them in, the, in a way that we survived in the manner we needed to survive and get to the right place. Leaders emerged in the moment that were able to lead us there, which is what we have to do and encourage in this. But that was your first question was, you said, what was your first one? Who? Who? So uh, there's, a, there's a couple. Um, I think, uh, and I'll mention a few, there's um, people that hold office in Washington today. Angus King, the senator from, from um, Maine, I think is a person that it, by and large most of the time when he's not caught up, but he, he, he does uh, affiliate with the Democrats, but I think he's, he's a voice. I think he's a very good voice. I think uh, Joe Manchin, uh, the former governor of West Virginia and the senator from, from uh, now a senator from West Virginia, for there. Um, I think at times John McCain, at moments John McCain is. I think he, he has exercised that. I, I think emerging Jeff Flake has emerged. Um, you may not agree with some of his conservative policies, but he's, a ver he, he's emerged. He actually said country over party in his speech. Um, that he's emerged on this. And so I think, I mean, there's a few. But again, I mean, I, and I'm very hopeful about them, and I'm hopeful about what you know what's going to emerge. I think this election is going to—you're going to see a huge amount of brand new people that are going to get elected. They're going to a whole bunch of brand new people, probably on the Democratic side, because I think there's a blue wave that's coming in this in response, not because of everybody's a Democrat, but because people are so frustrated about the system, and they're going to take it out 
on the incumbent party. But I think you saw that emerge in Virginia elections. There's these people that thought nobody would ever win mm -hmm. in the state legislature that were on the ballot and the brand new people. And the first time some of these people, I mean, look at the, 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 just the demographics that got elected and the various variations of diverse background of people that have been elected over the last year, or year and a half. It's unbelievable. So I'm very hopeful about that. that and I'm also hopeful that these kids that are watching this, and it's not just the high school in Florida, it's high schoolers all over the country and that age group all over the country is watching this and saying, I'm gonna get involved. I'm gonna work on a campaign. I'm gonna go do this. I'm gonna do this. And they're gonna vote. They're gonna vote in 2018 or they're gonna vote in 2020. And so I'm encouraged by all that. And I'm also, I think that for all of those failures, I think of technology and the divisions of tribalism of our communication, it's going to provide the opportunity for all of us to fix the system. It's going to be able to enable us to work through a system that has been so long been preoccupied by the dominant forces that this disruption, everybody thought that, as Jim said, everybody thought the taxi industry, and there's nobody going to ever disrupt the taxi industry. Everybody thought there's no way you can disrupt the hotel industry, right? And all of these, many of these industries, food delivery, all these things have been disrupted in many ways that everybody thought for long and long, for years and years and years, you couldn't disrupt them. I mean, we now have a private company sending rockets into space. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have guessed that would have happened 10 or 15 years ago. So I'm encouraged by all of that, and I think technology will help that. It's hurt us in some ways, but I think technology will help that. Yeah, I had a couple other questions over here. Do we have time in the back? Yeah, I was wondering for um, the people who say that they're independents, how many people you think are truly independent and that they, like you said before, you know, hold different beliefs that kind of would have fallen in line with both parties or who really do um, hold a lot of the beliefs that one of the major political parties have, but they just don't want to associate with the party because they're frustrated with the nature of the partisan system. But do, do, it, what's amazing is uh, it, I, the, the Republican Party is hard to recognize from what it was just a few years ago. I mean, I, I, would Ronald Reagan win a, a, a nomination at this point? I mean, I just can't can't imagine it. So we're having I don't this. Think George W. Bush did win the other one. Either. Right. George it's, w. Bush did not win. it's happened that fast. Yeah. It's it, it, there, we're going through this great resorting, you know, uh, and. Yes, the, the number of pure independents, there, there are limited numbers of those who are all the way into that independent camp. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to, to be done, but the, both the Republicans and the Democrats, so they're both trying to figure out what they are in this modern uh, world. Uh, I, I heard you know, the Democrats think they're going to win uh, this cycle uh, in the next presidential just because they're not them. Uh, but but I, I'll, I'll be the first to tell them, they better come up with what it is that they stand for awful quick uh, because it's not enough anymore just to be not them. Yeah. Any, somebody, yes, sir. Uh, back to the campaign finances, you didn't mention Citizens United, and New York Times today published an interesting thing about NRA contributions to candidates. And if you looked at Kansas, you would see that Senator Roberts got $700,000. Did that impact the race here? You were working in the Ordman campaign. I mean, that seems to be, I mean, the case here was the Democrats withdrew their senatorial candidate. So this was the chance for the independents, if they were there, to in fact do something. And looking at the New York Times, seems to me some money came in that was really a lot, and it was designed to do certain things. Yeah, there's no doubt that, uh, uh, th Money does have influence, but, but I would uh, second what Matthew said a little bit ago. Uh, message is, is much more critical these days than, than the money piece of it. And yes, uh, when I worked for uh, that Senate campaign, uh, we had a lot of money come in out of state and take a whack at us. Uh, pretty, and, it, and it hurt, I mean, it, it, no doubt about it. But, but campaigns are more about message and momentum when you get to that point. When you're in the mix and you're on the move in the end of a campaign, it, 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 it's almost irrelevant how much money is being thrown at TV. People start tuning it out. They're not listening to it anymore. It's just noise. It's just background noise of the stuff. Uh, now, yes, uh, micro-targeting and, and all the modern techniques of campaigns certainly can be put to use with a lot of money coming in. But, but but we weren't beat by just uh, one special interest group. It was uh, much more difficult than that. Uh, money matters, no doubt about it. 
and certainly we have to look at that from money and politics is a big deal, uh, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, but, but focus on uh, candidates that, that are able to break through and be able to connect with people beyond what the, the money is able to do for them. It's that message that they have. So I'm gonna, just gonna, first I'm going to say is I will never vote for anybody that's in bed with the NRA ever again. I, I will never do it again and again. And I'm a gun owner because I think they're a complete, this is my Matthew John Dowd's personal view, I think they're completely undermining the common good in our country. And I think that the, the, why this hasn't, why we haven't done anything on this is just square on their shoulders. I will never again vote for somebody that's in the bed with the NRA. That being said is, yes, they contribute a lot. They gave a lot to, to a lot of politicians. But their power is not about their money, mainly. I mean, their money, their country, their power is the threats they make about what they're going to do, mainly to Republicans in the primary mainly two Republicans in the primary, and they scare them enough to say, don't do anything because we're going to say you're against the Second Amendment. Don't say you're for increased universal background checks because we're going to say you're for taking everybody's gun away. And so it's more of a fear factor, and it's, it's more of a mythic fear factor. This is what I don't understand. I don't, the latest membership of the, Na of the National Rifle Association in the country, I think is just below three million people. Right? That's, that's what I think the latest membership is. I think there's 40 million gun owners in, the, in America. There's 40 million gun owners in America. Three million belong to the NRA. So it's a mythic membership, which is why if you poll gun owners, they're basically for the same things that everybody else wants. It's background checks, you know, what to do about the AR-15, you know, integrated databases, all the sorts of things that you could do that are universally supported. But it's much less about the money and much more about the belligerence and the voice they use among small groups of people, especially in primaries, to threaten people that they're going to destroy them on message uh, and scare them in such a way that, because there's a bunch of these people that vote for them that might, they only got $2,000 or something. It's not that about that. It's that their politicians walk in fear, unfortunately, ridiculously, of the NRA when they shouldn't. We have a bunch of disincentives in the system, and that's one of them. When, when the word primary gets turned into a verb, you, I, I'm going to primary you if, uh, if you don't agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, la last question. One more? No more? Well, uh, l let me say thank you to everybody for coming out on a snowy, uh, cold day. This was uh, an effort to get over here, and we, we absolutely appreciate it. But I really want to thank uh, Matthew Dowd for making an effort to come from warmer Texas up to, up to join us. <laughs> Uh, and Matthew, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'll, I'm just going to add one thing. I think we have a real opportunity. I think we can be, if you think about the people that were in the disruptive moment and the ultimate entrepreneurs were our founding fathers. They had a startup, and it was called a country. And they were people of means and people of power, and they were well connected in the monarchy, and they were very connected, but they basically said it's not working and we're going to start something else. And the last 14 words of the Declaration of Independence is, I think, something we can all take to heart because we can be the 21st century founding fathers, mothers, daughters, sons in this, of, the, of a new way and a new style and a country and a new America that we want to make. The last 14 words of the Declaration of Independence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And I think that's fundamentally what we need to do. We have to mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And I think we can do this. It's a moment in time, as I said, and it's ripe for it, and it's if we stand up and do it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Jim. Who's your guest next week? Next week is uh, uh, the uh, the one, the only Pat Cadell, uh, <laughs> uh, who was Jimmy Carter's pollster, who has been around Republic. He's still a Democrat, but he shows up on Fox News uh, frequently. Uh, but he is an absolute uh, genius at at uh, uh, political polling and having a pulse, uh, uh, finger on the pulse of America. So he'll come and join us. It'll be a fun uh, conversation. Thank you for the reminder, Bill.